Hey, it's a bait. So in this video, I'm going to be going over the exoplanet detection algorithm that I built using a classification model, uh, talking a little bit about the, the data set I used, uh, the way I approach this problem, how I frame my, my code, things like that, uh, mainly just to, to show my understanding and also share a bit of my, my curiosity. Now, the whole reason this project was something I decided to build is because I started learning about AI in late October of last year. Uh, and that was mainly just out of curiosity. I came across a three blue, one brown video on YouTube and then immediately just became curious about understanding the fundamentals of deep learning. And so I did things like build neural networks by hand, build an MNIST classification model from scratch, things like that. But I really wanted to set some direction for myself of where I was taking this learning and how I was going to apply all this knowledge that I had now on AI. And so I decided I wanted to cross it over with one of my biggest passions, which is space exploration. And so as a result, I, I started exploring, reading some research papers on what's a, what's a good milestone project I can build as someone who, who's just recently gotten into AI, just been in the space for a few months. Um, and so I came across a pretty interesting paper that talked about using data from the Kepler telescope to try and classify different objects that were uh, identified as whether or not they're exoplanets or not. I actually completed this project back in January. Uh, so it's been a little while, this, this video is a little overdue, but that's because I was working on something over February, which I'll, I'll share very soon in my Q1 update. Um, but anyway, since then, I've been working on more projects in this intersection between space exploration and, and machine learning. So I'll talk about those in, in future videos and, and sort of newsletter updates. But for the scope of this video, I'm going to be talking about the exoplanet detection algorithm. So let's talk a little bit about why this is a problem that's framed well to be solved by machine learning. Uh, and to understand that, we actually have to look at how are exoplanets detected in the first place? And so that all happens through a phenomenon mainly called transit. There's a few other uh, methods of detecting it, but for this data set, it's mainly using transit. And so I'll put a graphic up on the screen here, but essentially when the Kepler telescope is observing any star and it observes a dip in the brightness of that star for a certain interval period, what that usually is indicative of is a star that's passing between, the, or sorry, a planet that's passing between the Kepler telescope and the star that it's observing. So it seems like a pretty straightforward problem to solve for any human. Essentially, if you just see any star that has dips in brightness, that means it has an exoplanet revolving around it. But unfortunately, through the tens of thousands of examples, you'll see that you get a lot of different types of curvature. So you can't purely rely on just the periodicity of when these brightness drops happen or if they happen. Some of these could be instrumental errors. It could be other objects of interest passing by that aren't exoplanets. So it becomes very difficult to actually frame and, and solve this problem as a human. So as a result, you can actually solve this problem through machine learning. It becomes pretty simple. So what you have to do is just have astronomers go through and label a few thousand uh, of the examples as actual candidates, confirmed exoplanets, or false positives. And from there, you can feed that training set into your machine learning model, have it learn based and understand how different features correlate to the likelihood of something being an exoplanet, and then feed in the rest of your examples so that you can automatically label all of your data of all the different stars that you've observed rather than having to go through and physically put in a lot of man hours doing all of this and potentially not getting the same level of accuracy as the machine learning model. So now, with that being said, we can actually go take a look at the code I built, which is a, a classification model and how it goes through and solves this problem. So it starts off pretty simply. We're just using pandas to understand a bit about our data. So as we print out our data head here, you can see that we have over 50 features, uh, some of which aren't relevant. And so the first course of action in this entire problem was just figuring out which features are relevant, which ones are not. So I can understand which ones I need to keep in order to ensure that the model will train with the best possible features available to it. In order to understand exactly which features were relevant and would help train the model, uh, I use the exoplanet archive for this specific data set uh, from Caltech and essentially goes through and describes what each of the features does. And so I went through to understand the relevance of the features and how much it would actually help in detecting or determining that an object of interest was an exoplanet or if it was not. And so there was also a bit of trial and error involved. Uh, for example, some features I thought would be relevant but weren't, or features that I thought weren't relevant that actually did help significantly. Uh, there are better data science strategies to figure this out, which I'm just not familiar with. Uh, but having this data dictionary was pretty helpful. And for most of the features, I was able to get it just by reading through the different descriptions here. The unrelated features were I added them into an array and then dropped them from the uh, data as a whole and also dropped any of the NaN or null values uh, because when we go to compute our gradients, if we have NaN or null values, uh, that really messes things up and will give us a whole bunch of uh, errors and um, ones that you don't necessarily notice, but uh, the gradients will essentially just disappear and constantly be zero. 
uh, which completely throws off the training. So you want to make sure uh, what I made sure to do here was drop all the NAND values. And now if we look at our data head and our data shape, we have around 7,800 examples with 34 features. Uh, and the important thing to note here is actually what the target feature is going to be. So for that, I decided on using the KYP disposition value. Um, what that does is it just tells us if the object of interest is a candidate for being an exoplanet or if it's just a false positive. Uh, so it's a pretty straightforward binary classification problem. I initially did try to use a regression model based on the KY score, uh, but that didn't work out as well. Uh, the features weren't really built uh, or supported the regression style problem as much. So instead, I just use the KY score as a feature and our target variable, which is what the model will be solving for, is going to be this KYP disposition value. Now that we've got that, um, what's left to do is just pre-process the data. So before we get into actually building the neural network, we need to go through and pre-process the data, uh, mainly because, for example, this PYP disposition value, it's not in numerical format. So we have to convert that. So we're just able to use the pre-processing class from sklearn uh, and use the label encoder feature to go ahead and convert this into a numerical value. And then we're also able to get uh, and separate our data features. So we just drop the KYP disposition value from this. And so we have all of our features, which uh, again, 7,800 examples by 33, and as well as create a, uh, an array for our data target. So I decided to keep 20% of the total data as testing data, while the remaining 80% could be used for just training the model and ensuring it, uh, it has the correct uh, parameters. And what we wanted to also do is since we've been working with uh, pandas and sklearn this entire time, we need to convert our values from NumPy into Torch and turn them into Torch tensors. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, we have our X train, our X test, our Y train, our Y test, uh, ensuring that these are 1D tensors so that when we go to compare the values, the output of the model will also be a 1D tensor. So it makes it a lot easier and it doesn't throw you any errors with uh, the sizing of your tensors being wrong. What I find is the fun part, which is actually building out the model. So if we look at the total amount of training data we have, it's 62 examples by 33 features. And then of course we have the 1D tensor uh, for the labels, which is just uh, going to be the 6,200 examples and whether or not it's a, a candidate or a false positive. So we import our neural network class from Torch and using the number of features, we make that our input size for the model. And I decided to make this uh, classification model have two hidden layers. This was an arbitrary choice that I made sort of off of intuition of other problems I've done with data sets of similar size. I just found that that two hidden layers worked best. And so again, the number of neurons I chose here, which was 25 for the first one and 10 for the second one was also a bit arbitrary. And I experimented a bit to see which ones worked best and gave the higher, highest accuracy. Uh, and then output size, of course, we want that to be two since we're either looking for a candidate or a false positive. So we just go through and build our layers here. Uh, and for the first two layers, we apply a sigmoid activation function. And what that ensures is just nonlinearity between um, as the values are getting passed from the different neurons. Uh, and at the end, we want to run it through a log softmax function. So what that'll do is give us a probability of which one the model most likely believes it is, whether it's a candidate or a false positive, and how strongly it associates its likelihood with each of those. Hey, so post editing a bit here. I uh, thought I might explain this concept a little bit better about why we're using a log softmax. So essentially, let's say this is the output we got from our feed forward network. Um, it associates the number five with the candidate and one with the false positive. So in order to put this prediction between zero and one, so it's easier to classify, we put it through a, a softmax function initially. So if we take a look at that, what that does is just squeezes the number somewhere between zero and one, depending on what its value is. And we also add a log to whatever probability that gives us just because it makes it smoother for computation. So instead of taking potentially a, a large number, you're getting a log probability, which is always going to be smaller since it's on the logarithmic scale. And as a result, you might get an output of something like 0 0.8 and 0 0.2. So initially this number, which could be much larger, um, gets essentially squeezed by the softmax and then we add the log function for a bit smoother computation and then we can get our softmax output which gives us a, a better understanding of the probability of which one is more likely and by how much exactly. Now that we've gotten our model set up we need to just define our optimizer and our loss function so I use the atom optimizer which is pretty standard for most classification problems uh, most regression problems even so anything that's not super high skill you can just use an uh, atom optimizer which will just go through and update the parameters of the network uh, so it actually is the, the thing that's performing gradient descent. And for the loss function, uh, I chose negative uh, log likelihood. What this allows 
is for the values. So let's go back to the example of it believing there's a 0.8 uh, chance that it's a candidate uh, and a 0.2% or a 0.2 uh, 20% chance that it's a false positive. Let's say it actually ends up being the opposite. The label suggests that this specific example is actually a false positive. It'll take the uh, 0 0.2 and put it through a negative lawn function and what that will return is a very large value so for your loss function you're going to get a large value but let's say it ended up being correct and the 0 0.8 prediction was correct when it passes the 0 .3, 0 0.8 through that negative lawn function you'll get a value that is much lower and so it's indicative of a better performing model because of a lower loss function so now all that's left to do is simply just train and test our model so i defined uh 1050 epochs for this um, again, just what I thought was working best for the model. This could change. It was initially a thousand, but I bumped it up a little bit because I thought the model needed some more training. And so in this initial training pass, uh, we're always going to start by just resetting the gradient for every epoch. Uh, and then in this forward pass, we pass in our training data. And then in the backward pass, we're going to compute the loss. So compare what the model, the output of what the model gave us to the actual labels so we can calculate the loss. Uh, and then by doing loss dot backwards, we're able to calculate the gradients to understand where the improvements have to be made. And then optimizer, uh, the atom optimizer will step through and update every parameters with the new gradient values. And then we also, now that we have these updated gradient values, we run it through the test data. So all our parameters are up to date. We can now do the same thing, just run it through the test data and then analyze the loss for that. And based on the number of predictions it got, correct versus over the total number of predictions as a whole we can get the accuracy for the model and so that happens for every single epoch so it'll train update the parameters run it on the test data see how accurate it is and then again train test and so uh, as you can see here for every 50th epoch i already ran the, the training for the model to see how it goes and uh, there is a slight bit of overfitting as you can see here in the end we were at about 95%, but then it declined, or we were at 94%, and it went down. So that's just saying that the model was trying uh, to fit and update more than it needs to. Uh, it already at one point reached some of the most optimal parameters. But yeah, as you can see, it gradually improves from mid 60% into roughly about 95%. So there's a, there's a pretty neat accuracy for this model. That basically wraps up the walkthrough for this project. Uh, as I mentioned, this was just a small milestone project that I made when I started off my machine learning journey. Uh, and since then, I've been working on other projects in the same intersection of machine learning and space technologies. So there will be another project video that comes out in the, in the next few weeks, as well as my Q1 update will come out at the end of March, which is just going to be talking about what I've been doing for the first three months of this year. And there's some pretty cool stuff in there. So if you want to check that out, I'll link the description to my uh, newsletter link down below. Uh, but that basically wraps up this video uh, and I hope you took something away from this.